Welcome. You've got digital folklore. This is the story of Perry Carpenter and Mason Amadeus. Oh, and a talking raccoon named Digby. There's no time to explain. Together, they're on an adventure to unlock the secrets of modern folklore, interviewing experts, and delving into online rabbit holes. But, <laughs> as it turns out, they may be in over their heads. I'm Perry Carpenter. And I'm Mason Amadeus. And this is Digital Folklore. I think too often people kind of lump in all conspiracy theorists together. If you're a conspiracy theorist, then you're a little bit crazy. I really don't think that there's very many people, if any, who are truly lost to reason, because everyone changes given time. My name is Mick West, and I specialize in how to talk to people who believe in a conspiracy theory and how to help them escape the rabbit hole. Really, conspiracy theorists and conspiracy theories both span a spectrum. Everybody has a position on that spectrum where they think that everything that's lower than that position is a perfectly reasonable conspiracy theory. And everything that's on the other side of it is a silly bit of misinformation or disinformation or nonsense or craziness. And it's usually a fairly sharp dividing line. To get drawn down the rabbit hole, you essentially have to consume enough information to change your worldview. And usually this requires a good degree of spare time. But if you kind of reach a critical mass of conspiracy theorists, where there's lots of people around you who believe these things, then it's really, really easy to get sucked into that because it becomes, in a way, the default position. So how can we actually have a good conversation with someone who believes a conspiracy theory? And how can we then most effectively engage with them in a way that has a good outcome? If you think of someone automatically as being on your side, you view a conversation as working together rather than if you see the person you're talking to as stupid or crazy or as you know, being brainwashed or something like that. If they tell you something, you want to ask them why they believe that thing without coming across as confrontational. You know, you can't just say, why do you believe that ridiculous idea? You ask them, where can I learn more about this? And then you can get to talking about what is a trustworthy source and what isn't, and then why they think that. Lead them towards figuring out the answer for themselves rather than telling them the answer. Guide them towards it. There are certainly people who you can't reach that day, or maybe even that week, or maybe even that month. But I think the key place that we can find hope is in the knowledge that people do get out of the rabbit hole. People who seem to be once completely unreachable have eventually become much more reasonable, rational people who no longer believe in these conspiracy theories. This is something that I've seen time and time again. Ugh. God, I don't feel like I slept at all. Huh? Um. You have one new voice message. Hey, Perry, it's Mason. We're gonna need to do something. Digby's getting worse. Uh, now it's, I don't know, some kind of extraterrestrial parasite infesting the people who are behind this. I don't know. I've given up trying to follow, but man, you wouldn't believe the amount of packages he's been ordering. It's like everything from supplements to radiation detectors. Oh, and the latest fun development is that at least once a day, I've got to fight him off the Wi-Fi modem because he keeps trying to put it in a Faraday cage and then I can't get any signal and I just, I can't do this anymore. 
we need to find some kind of professional at this point, so I, I'm gonna look online, but I, if you have any ideas, can you just call me and let me know? Thanks. Bye. End of new messages. Right. Uh, well, I guess I know what we're doing today. Hey, uh, get ready. I'm coming by to pick up you and Digby. Oh, thank God. I'm about to lose it over here. She's been pulling all the furniture away from the walls to check for microchips in the baseboard. If you can just hang tight for a little bit, I remembered something that might help. Oh? For my cybersecurity podcast, I interviewed this guy named Mick West all about conspiracy theories and deprogramming. And I had a dream last night. Somebody who worked his way into my dream because of all this conspiracy stuff. And But I remembered that he sent me an address for this place that specializes in helping people with situations just like Digby. That would be... <laughs> that would be awfully convenient right now. Yeah, but the thing is, this, this place, it's a bit sketchy, and it's very far away. Hey! I'm gonna have to take out this drop ceiling! No, no, no Digby! They could no, be wait. hiding anything up there. Digby! Perry, hi. Honestly, I don't care how sketchy or far away it is. This has to stop. All right, I'll be there in 15 minutes. Um, tell Digby something like, we found the secret headquarters or right. whatever. He'll eat it up, I'm sure. Yeah, no, that that's a good idea. Uh, I'll see you soon. Dig Digby! Digby! You see that too, right? Yeah, I do. Is is this the... The GPS says this is it. The little pin icon is right on that door. Next to the... Yep, next to the clown. <sighs> Great. He, he's looking right he's at us. He's staring right at us. Are we at the lair of the hive? Yeah, buddy, yeah, I think we're here. Excellent. Uh, tell you what, you hang here... Perry and I will go up real quick, make sure everything's on the level, and then we'll come back and get you, all right? Be careful. Don't make eye contact for longer than three seconds. Right. And if they ask your full name, don't even think it too loudly. Yes, of course. And I need both of you to wear these. They're mind shields. This is extremely literal, huh? They aren't perfect but they will make it harder for them to steal your thoughts. Yeah, hey, I'm not trying to start an argument again or anything, but don't you think they're gonna notice if we walk up wearing literal tinfoil hats? No, no, no. Remember, their senses don't work like ours. Right. So, as long as you don't think too hard about the mind shields, they won't be able to see them. Okay, right. Yup. <clears throat> you ready to do this? Yeah, uh, I guess so. Wait! Each of you take two of these. Oh, my God. Supplements? Really? No. They're a special blend of prophylactic nootropics that will help suppress your brain's beta and theta waves. D these are just caffeine and fish oil, and they smell god-awful. All natural. No chemicals. Yeah, okay, cool. Here. Down the hatch. <clears throat> oh. Oh. Stuck to the back of my throat for a second. All right, let's go. Digby, just sit tight. Okay. But if you're not back in 20 minutes, I'll blow the place wide open. What is that? It, it's just an old Walkman. Don't say anything. Roger that, Digby. Yes, uh, we'll report back soon. This is our only shot, but be safe. Yeah, don't worry, Digby. We got this. I don't know what I like less, Digby being so extremely committed to this conspiracy stuff or the way that clown is looking at us. To be fair, we look ridiculous. Oh, he has no right to judge. He's in a freaking clown costume. Shh, shh, shh. Nice hats. H Hello. Can I help you? We, uh, we have an appointment. Oh, yeah? Yeah, for the, for the deprogramming. Ah, yes, yes. They're, they're they're still with the last group before you. Um, they should be done soon. Then you can go in. All right. So, who are you? Security. And the clown costume is... Well, look, people aren't too eager to mess with someone who's standing in a dark alley at night wearing a clown costume, are they? Valid. Are you, like, an actual clown? Like, did you 
go to clown school? No. Okay. Um, what's your name? Ben. Ben Radford. What do you do besides, I guess, clown security? Well, for one thing, I'm one of the world's few scientific investigators of the paranormal and weird claims. I've written a dozen books, give or take. Got a master's degree in public health, a uh, master's degree in education, and also a uh, degree in psychology. So I, I do stuff like that. Um, I'm also a member of the American Folklore Society, as well as the International Society for Contemporary Legend Research. Oh, holy smokes. And you're, what, moonlighting as clown security? Please stop saying clown security. Right now, I'm embedded. I'm doing research. Fascinating. Hi, I'm Ben Radford, author of a dozen or so books. I'm a folklorist, a researcher, investigator, and a doer of weird things. So uh, welcome to the show. One of the things that I love about you and then love about your um, your show and your work is the uh, the skeptic's angle that you take on things. I'm interested in like, how do you get into that as a career and then the unique way that you do it, because I think that you have a, a much more approachable tone than some of the other members of the skeptic community. How do you end up giving a career to investigating all this fun stuff that you get to investigate? Yeah, it's a it's a it's an odd story. <laughs> how, how did you end up here? <laughs> in my case, uh, like most people, I was always interested in weird things. Right. I was a kid. I was growing up. And, you know, I remember being 8, 10, 12 years old, and I'm I'm seeing these TV shows, and this is before podcast, kids, so <laughs> this is how old I am. I, these TV shows and radio shows and movies and things on, you know, mysterious th- topics, right? There was In Search Of and, and, you know, and all these sorts of things. And I was fascinated, right? I'm like, oh, this is so cool. You know, there's aliens, you know, landing in, in crops and making circles, and they're abducting people, and there's, there's Bigfoot out there and the Loch Ness Monster, and I'm just... And I grew up in this in in this tiny small desert town in New Mexico, which I actually don't live too far from there now. And to me, growing up as a kid, these mysteries seemed very far afield. Like they're all it's in Scotland. Like where's Scotland? I don't know. It's like cold. It's I don't know. It's 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 up there by England, right? I didn't know. And it seemed like all these mysteries that I was hearing all these dramatic sensational stories about were in these far off places. And I was like, oh, I, I kind of I want to go investigate. Right. I want to I want to go see the I want to go find Bigfoot. I'm wanting to sort of get into researching these things. And so I would buy a lot of used books. And so I would get my allowance and I would go to a, a used bookstore not far from the elementary school that I went to. And I would I would come home with just stacks of books under my arms. And these are books on UFOs and, and runes and mysteries and psychics and all these sorts of stuff. And I'm just reading these and I'm fascinated by them. And, you know. It's very authoritative, right? Because it's a book and like the person's name is on the cover. Like they wouldn't publish if it weren't true. I mean, it's like you, you know, I, I assumed in my in my 10 year old naivete that, well, of course it's true. You know, some publisher, it's in, it's printed. Look at that. It's literally li- printed on the page. So, you know, I had this sort of the, this sort of aspect to it. So so for for several summers, again, in my early teens, uh, I would read all these books and I was just fascinated by them. And I, I really believed them. I was like, oh, my God, this is this world is so crazy and wild. There's all these sorts of things. But I gradually became disillusioned because I realized that there was very little actual investigation. Most of the books I was reading, all these you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, sort of dramatic, sensational pulp uh, books, they all had these these, you know, these breathless, you know, dramatic, sensational stories, but there didn't seem to be anybody that, that was actually investigating them. And, you know, when you when I read closer at these books and in 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 the in the TV shows and things like that, it was clear that it was mostly what what I now recognize as folklore. It was stories, it was legends, it was, you know, friend of a friend, right? Who who said this, right? It's it is said that. And I'm like, hold on here. You know, I I I want to know for myself, I don't want to just take someone else's word for it, some random publisher or some random author who I've never heard of, who I'm being presented as, as being factual. So that sort of led me to a degree in psychology and sort of looking at the different ways in which people, you know, can misperceive things and misunderstand things. Uh, and then that sort of get, got me on the path of, of, uh, of doing these sorts of investigations. And that that makes sense how you end up writing a whole book about creepy clowns and getting into creepy clowns, right? Because that is just another one of those phenomena. Yeah, and 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 the the clown one was was kind of interesting because you know I had um, I had written several books before that, uh, including on lake monsters and and mysteries and things like that. 
and I had actually uh, backburnered it. Uh, I was like, there's a, there's a book, you know, I, re- I recognized that there were lots of people who were interested in clowns. And of course, in pop culture, the, the evil clown trope was everywhere, right? Pennywise, the Joker, um, John Wayne Gacy, uh, and, you know, just all over the place, the Harlequin figure, Punch and Judy, this and that, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And yet there was very little actual research done, as far as I could tell, on the, on the social and cultural significance of that and the history of it. So I want to do something that's new and fresh. And so, again, I was, I was certain that somebody else had already done this book and I didn't need to do it. But the more I looked into it, no, <laughs> Some, well, shit, I guess I'll do it. So that sort of that launched me into the the uh, the evil clown research. I'm curious if in, in your research for that, when you were looking at the more contemporary stories of bad or creepy clowns, if you had one that is your favorite for some reason, whether it's just a particularly creepy one or if it's just really dumb, a story from when they resurged at some point in popular media. You know, it's interesting. You know, I was often asked uh, when clowns went bad. Right. Because there was this notion that, you know, clowns were good. And then Stephen King and then the, the Shioda brothers with Killer Clowns Matter Space and this and that, that at some point there was this cultural event or this Thanos snap finger. I don't know. <laughs> there was a time when clowns suddenly turned evil. And uh, and and that was one thing that that, that I, I at first believed. I, I assumed that, yeah, it's like, when did clowns go bad? And then I sort of realized that it, you're you're asking the wrong question because clowns clowns were never good. You know, in America, there was this notion that clowns were good because of the influence of, for example, Bozo the Clown, Ronald McDonald. So a whole generation of Americans grew up with ostensibly happy, good burger pushing. Like the, the rodeo clown type yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was it was against that background that the evil clowns sort of came out. And so, you know, when, when Stephen King, you know, came up with Pennywise... He wasn't doing this subversive thing like, oh, clowns are good. Now they're bad. It's like, you know, if you if you look at clowns elsewhere, for example, in Europe, clowns were always this ambiguous characters. In many places around the world, they never had this assumption that many Americans did that clowns were inherently good. They're like, yeah, <laughs> clowns are they're like fairies, right? Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. You don't mess with them and this and that. So that sort of answers that sort of touches on your question is to yeah. sort of like the, the 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 bad or the evil clowns, right? I would say probably one of the more interesting sort of evil clowns that I came across was the Northampton clown. And we can talk more about that later, but he basically spawned the, the scary clown panic of 2016. So uh, tell us a little bit, because we did have the the recent clown panic, the one that everybody's thinking about with the creepy clown standing around, just kind of making people unsettled. Tell us a little bit about the, the story of that. And then um, you do mention this, you know, trickster angle, I'm sure from your psychology background, you're thinking just some of the, you know, psychology of creepiness and uncanniness and things that fit into that. But but what made that become the thing that it that it did as it became this new panic? Well, yeah, there were, there were a couple things going on. Um, so uh, basically, the topics that I cover in the book, it's one of the last chapters is is what are called phantom clowns. And these are evil clowns that are, and again, this, this goes right into folklore because it, it's, it's essentially a folkloric phenomena, but it bled over and bleeds over into mass media and things like that. So the phantom clowns actually begin in the, in the 1980s. Uh, and you know, there's, there's a whole, I, we could talk for a couple hours on this. I'll try and sort of give you the overview. But basically, in the early 80s, there were reports of scary clowns driving around trying to abduct children either by, by themselves or sometimes in white vans, because, of course, vans are a popular folkloric motif. And uh, as you might imagine, this panicked teachers and parents because, oh, my God, right, there's somebody trying to abduct kids and not only that, but they're also clowns. So there, there's that added layer of, oh, and by the way, they're clowns. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was all this panic, as you might imagine, and parents and everyone's freaking out. So they called the police. The police investigated no sign of the clowns. Like, just there's nothing there. No witnesses, no anything else like that. And yet the, the kids kept uh, telling these stories and they kept saying, you know, uh, a week later and the, the stories actually spread from place to place, you know, in typical folkloric fashion. And um, over the course of several months, and in fact, several years between 81 and like 84, 85, these sporadic ports of these these clowns. But again, there was never any evidence of them. None were ever arrested. There was never any evidence. There was no, for the most part, adults didn't see them. These were stories and rumors that circulated among children and from children to the parents and teachers. 
So uh, Lauren Coleman, uh, in his book *Mysterious America*, uh, was is credited for for being the first to write about these these uh, phantom clowns. And there were later re- reoccurrences. For example, there was some in Honduras and England and elsewhere. So the 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 phantom clown panic sort of as as usual they emerged, they reached a peak, and they sort of faded away. Often around Halloween, uh, which which probably won't, won't surprise you. In any event, so that's the history of these clowns. And as a folklorist and someone who's written about these sorts of weird things, I, I, I knew that typically around Halloween, there would be these these panics, right? These sort of moral panics. There's ones about tainted Halloween candy, which Joel Best has written about and others as well. You know, the Halloween sadist uh, legends and things like that. And this sort of tied in with with that. And it wasn't really until uh, 2013 when, when that blended with social media. And you had uh, what was called Northampton Clown. There was a guy in Northampton, England, who dressed as a clown, and he didn't, it's interesting, he didn't threaten anyone. He was intentionally creepy, though, right? So he would stand uh, sort of waving to people silently as they drove by on the streets, right? Usually at night or in, uh, or in parks. Again, he wasn't threatening anybody, he didn't have any weapons, but it was just intriguing enough to go viral, which is exactly what he was expecting and exactly what happened. So sure enough, uh, the Northampton clown... It had its own hashtag, people reporting seeing the clown, dating photographs of them, sometimes with him. But nobody knew who he was. He would just sort of appear, you know, late at night and do these sorts of things and, you know, hand out balloons now and then and sort of fritter away. And it later turned out because, uh, as, as I'm sure you know, England is full of security cameras. There are more security cameras in England than anywhere else in the world, as far as I know. So it's harder to get away with that sort of thing in the UK. And sure enough, people eventually tracked him down. But it wasn't the police because keep in mind that dressing as a clown isn't illegal. So even though he was sort of unnerving people and making people wonder what's going on, this and that, he wasn't doing anything illegal. So they call the cops. They're like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> anyway, it turned out that it was, in fact, a, uh, a local um, young filmmaker who was, you know, trying to sort of get it, get some publicity. And uh, they actually spawned copycats. There was another case in the Staten Island clown. Uh, there was a case of a year or two later where, once again, you had a, an evil clown that was seen in the Staten Island. Again, not threatening anybody, but just, you know, clowns out of their context are inherently creepy. So for the most part, the scary phantom clowns sort of faded away, like the real life ones. I'm not talking about the Joker and Pennywise. I'm talking about sort of real life viral video, actually somebody in a clown costume, although not necessarily clowns, it's important to make that distinction, just because you buy a clown mask doesn't make you a clown, which is a point that many clowns pointed out to me, like, just so we're crystal clear, right? Buying a, you know, buying a mask doesn't make you a clown. That, yeah, that's fair. I can see how they'd want to protect that. Yeah, yeah, like, because, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole honorable tradition and, you know, you know, makeup and designs. I mean, there's a whole clown industry and, and, and subculture that I, I, I respect. I don't, it's not, that, that wasn't the particular angle that I took for my book, but I, I'm aware of it and I respect it. So against this background, we have the 2016 Phantom Clown Panic. And it was odd because uh, my book had actually been published, I think, in March of that year. And then around Halloween was when this clown panic, just shortly short before Halloween is when this clown panic emerged. And I actually had people who were like, so, Ben, where were you the other night? Because there was an evil clown who was like, yeah, were you behind them? I'm like, no, this is not a publicity stunt. I could have predicted it just because I've researched it. But I mean, I, I wasn't behind it just, just for the record. I had nothing to do with it other than trying to explain it to people. Basically, in August uh, 2016, in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, there were reports of children, uh, once again, that were almost being abducted. Not being abducted, but almost being abducted by clowns. And most of the reports were from children, just as we saw in previous years and even back in the 80s uh, in Massachusetts and elsewhere. And when the the adults were asking about well, what happened, they would say the kids would say that there was uh, there were clowns living in the woods behind these apartment buildings. This is more urban than you might expect. And yet behind this one apartment building, there were a copse of woods. Uh, and so the story went, if you followed a trail into the woods, 
and <laughs> Hansel and Gretel uh, uh, motifs were coming out. You would finally find not a house of candy, but a house of clowns, where allegedly a bunch of clowns lived together in some sort of clown commune who they were sitting around waiting for children to abduct. Again, this is this is straight out of Stephen King, right? Stephen King in, in fairy tales. And once again, as with the previous uh, phantom clown panics, there was never any evidence of this. Of just kids are kids are saying this every now and then. You you have an adult who would say, you know, I saw something in the woods, right? Because once you tell people to look for anything weird, whether it's Bigfoot or UFOs, Russ, they're going to see it because they've been psychologically primed, right? And so when these rumors circulate in this community, and everyone's talking about it, because why wouldn't you, right? Child abductions folded in with with, with scary clowns. So every now and then there would, act, there would also be a parent who would say, yeah, I saw something, you know, it was in the woods. And and at one point they were actually firing weapons or firing, firing guns and, and bullets into the into the woods. Fortunately, nobody was hurt, but this was taken pretty seriously. And so this happened. Uh, and and again, I'm following this in real time. Right. So it was it was fascinating to me having written bad clowns and having done research on this. So I would wake up in the morning with a Google alert <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm just like every morning I'd wake up like. What what weird clown is going on today? And sure enough, so exactly as happened previous years, the sightings you know spread and spread and spread. Um, so it wasn't just in in, uh, in South Carolina; it went to other cities in Atlanta, uh, Michigan. It just this this sort of snowballing effect. And what what began to happen was that even though there were never any clowns or anyone else arrested or or identified in in the original case. Other people would see these news stories and they would dress up as clowns and and basically do copycat hoaxes. Ostension. Yeah, ostension, exactly. So people would, they'd see on the news like, oh, did you hear about these crazy clowns? Yeah, that's crazy. Like, hey, I got a, I got a clown mask in my closet. You want, you want to go cruise Walmart and scare some old ladies? Yeah, let's do it. I was really expecting and fearful that a lot of that would turn into clown just being shot. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the concerns, right? Because, you know, with ostension, anytime you're acting on a legend, there's the chance that someone's actually going to get hurt. Look, if you're acting out Bloody Mary, you know, <laughs> go in your bathroom, light a candle, say Bloody Mary 13 times or 100 times, take your pick. The chance of Bloody Mary actually coming in and harming you are close to zero. However, if you're dressing as a clown, whether or not you have bad intentions and you're, and you're running after kids in a park, they're going to get you killed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. not the wisest move in the world. Yeah, this is that right. Exactly. So but you had this fascinating blend of. So in the 2016 clown panic, uh, you had some hoaxes, right? You had people who were who were basically faking clown sightings. So you would have people who would say, yeah, I saw an evil clown. A clown knocked on my window at midnight and ran away. And people would investigate, and that didn't happen. They, they later admitted it didn't happen. There was uh, one woman I remember I wrote about who was late for her job at McDonald's, ironically. And the reason she was late, she said, was that a clown, as she was getting into her car, a scary clown came at her with a knife. Fortunately, she was able to fight him off, but it made her, you know, 20 minutes late for work. She later admitted this, <laughs> this was, of course, a, a, a hoax. So, so there were... There were hoaxes, people who were faking not only clown sightings, again, just a flat out hoax. They later admitted they made the whole thing up. But then you also had copycats. So you had people where they would hear about these stories. And again, they would they would perform it. They would you know, like, hey, everyone's making the news. It's a low risk, high, high yield prank. Right. Because if you're successful, you make national news. Right. You got right. you got John Muir. On ABC News talking about you or CNN, right? Yeah. There's a clip of you. If you're in trouble, you're arrested. Okay, 17-year-old in a clown mask. What are you going to do with me? All right. So, and, and then you also that also morphed into, for example, viral videos. And so there were actually uh, what were called clown lockdowns. So in Alabama, for example, in other places as well, schools were actually locked down. And what would happen is that uh, that people dressed as clowns, typically students which won't come as a surprise to anybody who went to high school. They're like, I don't want to go to math class today. Hey, I have an idea. So they would they would put on a clown mask or do a little clown thing, and they would put something on, on TikTok or Instagram or, or any social media. It's like, hey, you know, I'm going to come shoot up the school. I wouldn't open the school on Monday. And it's interesting, right, because the police have to take that seriously because, unfortunately— in America, there are school shootings, right? So it, it's, an, it's they're just dovetailing onto this phenomenon. So there was this interesting dynamic where the police couldn't ignore the threat because technically it's a threat against the school. If you are in charge of protecting school security and you ignore a threat against the school, 
and it happens, you lose your job, you are public enemy number one. On the other hand, you could be 99.7% sure this is bullshit. So there was this, this tension. And so what would happen is that the schools would be concerned about it. Again, probably often recognizing that there wasn't any truth to it, but they got to be better safe than sorry. The police take the same tack. And then what happens is that parents who might otherwise think this is all silly, it's legitimized by the police and by, by the schools because yeah. they're like, you know, I didn't think this was true. You know, this all seems silly to me. But, you know, my I got an email from from the from the school saying that they're shutting down the school. Oh, my God, there must be something to it. So this sort of self-legitimizing aspect of the whole clown phenomena. Anyway, so that that was sort of th that that launched uh, that went again from about August or September and it sort of rose right around Halloween, then sort of peaked by by November, and then it sort of faded away. So that was sort of, that was the, the the basics of the the 2016 uh, scary clown panic. You, uh, as I look at your work and have heard you uh, speak on different shows, uh, read a little bit of your stuff, or hopefully more than just a little bit of your stuff. It seems like when you really evangelize for a skeptical approach to things, you're not doing this maybe the way that some people might personify or or try to make uh, the skeptics view very cartoonish or or polarizing um it seems like you go in with a lot of respect for people who have certain different uh, beliefs or who are reporting things and you you are very very curious about the way that you do it can you talk about that because you do seem to be a very you know, like the friendly skeptic in a lot of ways <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, skepticism is, is a big tent. And there are lots of people who call themselves skeptics. Oftentimes, they're not skeptics at all. For example, the Ghost Hunters guys. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've seen them either in an interview or writing, like, well, we're skeptics. Are you? But so, you know, pe people love to, it's the sort of same thing with, you know, the imprimatur of science. Even if they don't genuinely respect science, they know that other people do. So this is mm -hmm. why pseudoscientists and, and ghost hunters, and they all like to sort of, well, we're scientific, even though, of course, that they're not at all. And so, you know, it's interesting, you know, coming from that tradition of, of, of skepticism and, and skeptical inquiry and, and, and for education, right? So you have people like the amazing Randy, uh, the late Randy, who was a colleague of mine. Of course, he, he was around forever. Randy tried to sort of, you know, walk that line. He would debunk people, but, you know, he didn't really embrace the debunker label. And nor do I, because my goal is to investigate as as a result of that I often debunk claims. But that's not my I'm not trying to go into it, trying to say this is clearly bullshit. Let me prove why. And I think part of that goes back to my my background in psychology, because I am so cognizant of the ways in which people can misunderstand things, mis misperceive things, fool each other and just sort of, you know, most people that come to me with their experiences, you know, they saw a ghost, they saw something weird. They saw they had some deeply profound experience that they believe was supernatural over else. Most of them are sincere. They're not lying. They're not crazy. They're not stupid. They genuinely believe that. And I can tell that. And so if I'm going to come to them and, and sort of dismiss them like, well, you know, this is crazy. You know, nobody, everybody knows these things aren't real. Then that's not going to help them at all. In one of my books, uh, Big If True, I begin uh, with a, a, a section on a woman that contacted me because she believed that she was cursed. And this happened several years ago. And I won't go into the whole story, but basically she said, you know, I, it was this very heart, heart wrenching email. And I, I'm certain it wasn't a hoax. I mean, it was clear that it was absolutely true or she believed it was true. And so I had, I was tr struggling with that, right? Because you know, I don't want to reinforce her idea that she actually is the victim of a curse because it's almost certainly not true. And certainly based on my research and psychology and this and that, at the same time, if I had just emailed her back and said, curses aren't real, get over it, get a life, that's number one, not going to help her out. It's not going to help me out. It's not going to make skeptics look any good. And it's, it's just counterproductive. And so, so to the extent that I can, when I'm doing these investigations, whether it's crop circles or ghosts or psychics or psychic media, take your pick, I try and approach it from a, you know, a, a genuine investigative point of view where, you know, I'll go into a location and I'll say, look, help me understand what's going on. I'm not here to to show the, show you that you're wrong. I'm not here to say you're stupid. I'm here to help us understand what you experienced. And if I can if I can offer them a plausible alternative explanation for what they experienced in terms of a haunting or overall, 
that helps them out and they and they can see that I'm making a sincere effort. So uh, I do try and do that. I am sort of known as one of the more diplomatic skeptics, uh, which I take pride in because I, I think that's how you help people. Yeah. And I, I think even in in your books, like when you're talking about doing scientific research in the paranormal, you're actually trying to give legitimate, good, actionable advice to that community about here's how you could uplevel your game to potentially gain more credibility to uh, to, to not just give in to pseudoscience or whatever the, uh, the the fad of the day is for trying to, to find these things. But here's how to apply a scientific process to the thing that you're trying to legitimately look for. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, that's that's always been my approach is, you know, I... In what I do, I've spoken to ghost hunting groups. I've spoken to Bigfoot groups. I say, look, I'm not the enemy here. It's like, I may be more skeptical than you are, but we're all trying to solve the mystery. I I, I genuinely am, right? If there's a ghost mm-hmm. somewhere, I want to find that out. If Bigfoot's out there, Chupacabra's out there, believe me, I want to be the front of the line to, to find this out. And, and so, you know, that's one of the themes, and I'm glad, Perry, that you recognize that, is, you know, is when I criticize these these groups and these people that aren't doing good research, it's not because I think the topic is too stupid to look at. It's not because I think this is too silly. It's because exactly the opposite, because I do take it seriously, because I'm saying, yes, this is a this topic is worth investigating. It's worth doing good research on. And because of that, do better research. So that's the theme of, you know, I did this book, Investigating Ghosts. And part of it is for ghost hunters to up their game. Say, look, man, if you think ghosts are real, more power to you. Do better research, do better quality research. And if if what you're saying is true, then you'll prove it. But the quality of the research that you're doing and the methodologies and research design, it's just it's just so poor that of course you're not getting good evidence. Oh. All right, I, I just got a text. They're they're ready for you. Cool. Um thanks for talking with us. Of course. It, it gets boring out here. Right. Uh we'll go get Digby and then head in. Thanks again. Mm-hmm. Well, that was not what I was expecting. I feel like we say that every time we run into someone interesting. Which we do fairly often. You never know what you're going to find if you keep your eyes open. Yeah, but I feel like we're constantly stumbling into weird situations these days. So what's the scoop? Did they suspect you? Oh, uh, uh, no, they, they didn't suspect a thing. We're in. Excellent. We've actually got an appointment for you um, to... To talk to their leader. Yes. I'll get this little hidden mic set up. And then once I capture enough evidence, we can take it back to the studio and blow the whistle on this once and for all. Perfect, perfect. And um, because of your implant, they will not be able to mind control you. Oh, I didn't think of that. They're probably expecting human brain patterns. You are right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's go. Let's come on. Let's. We'll escort you in. Oh, and uh, one one last thing. Remember, once you're in there, you need to play along. Okay, whatever they say, just go along with it. Yeah, and, and we're going to be listening for any signs of trouble. So if something happens, we'll jump in and get you right out of there. Okay. I never thought I'd get to be part of something so, so earth-shattering and important, you know? Yeah, I, I, you're really one lucky raccoon. Right this way. Watch your step, little guy. Thank you, fellow human clown. Oh, well, this is a lot more well-lit than I thought it was going to be. It has like a dentist office vibe. Yeah. Of course it does. They need to keep up appearances. Hello, do you have an appointment? Uh, yeah, we do. It should be under Digby Cooper. Ah, Digby. Right this way. Uh, yeah, sure. You two can hang out here in the waiting area with Brent. And when Digby's all done, we'll bring him right back out to you. Thanks. Good luck, Digby. I'll see you both again soon. So I guess we just uh, pull up a seat and hang out with uh, Brent over there. Yeah, I take it. It's got to be that guy in the corner, right? Hey. Hello. Hi there. So I take it you're, uh, you're Brent. Hi, I'm Brent Lee. I am the host of Some Dare Call a Conspiracy, a podcast that aims to deconstruct and demystify popular conspiracy theories. You have an interesting story of your own, of your journey with conspiracy. Why don't you give us the the the, the breakdown of that, like, just to start off? Yeah, well, the reason why I do this um, is cons- conspiracy theories is a subject quite close to my heart, because I myself 
believed some really hardcore conspiracy theories for 15 years. So from 2003 to 2018, I was totally consumed, I would say, by conspiracism and like the idea that some overarching secret society or network of cults was running the world, essentially. <laughs> it was a very long journey and it starts in 2003. So yeah, what was the, the like tipping point, the beginning of that? See, I, it was 2003. We were on the cusp of war with Iraq. And, you know, the sentiment was that this was built on a lie and it, the weapons of mass destruction claims were a lie, you know, uh, and I didn't trust why we were going to Iraq. I understood why we had gone into Afghanistan. 9-11 happened and you can see that's an obvious outcome that someone's going to go to war over that attack. But Iraq was just out, out the blue. And I got to say this because it's like context for, I guess, why I eventually bought the conspiracy theory videos that I came across, which were 9-11 conspiracy theories. And they presented an argument that basically this 9-11 attack was an inside job by the American government and various intelligence agencies around the world. And basically it was to start this war on terror and eventually go to Iraq and then to Iran, you know, and further afield. And that sentiment just, it really just spoke to me. You know, that's where it kind of really starts. And then I need to find out, well, who are these people? You know, and then this kind of secret society, uh, Freemason, skull and bones idea. At the time, you know, Bush had just beat Kerry, John Kerry in a presidential race. And both of them were from Yale and both of them were in a secret society called Skull and Bones. Right. So it kind of played into this idea that all the politicians were actually on the same side, you know, and, and again, it's just a rabbit hole. You just keep going further and further, coming across new things. But the, that that initial push was sort of seeing something that felt incongruous, which was the the invasion of Iraq that didn't really line up with like any reason you could think of as to why. And then you start to, yeah. f you, to find these alternate reasons that, that you find. Was it primarily online? Yeah, it was because it was 2003. There was no social media at that time. There was no Google video or YouTube, anything like that. But I'm a music producer. So I always used to use like peer to peer software, software exchange, and we would download other people's folders or whatever. And obviously I could come across music and videos and I like to download documentaries. It was something I like to watch. And I just came across these 9-11 documentaries. I didn't know they were conspiracy theory ones. And I was just thought, oh, cool, I'll download them because I like, I like to be informed about like geopolitics. So let me download these. And it just presented like full on conspiracies. I was just blown away by it. I thought I had uncovered a crime and that this community of people had uncovered this grand deception, you know, and that carried on for like my, my whole journey. Yeah. Well, I think that the key phrase that you use there is that you believed you had uncovered it, you know, the grand deception, kind of capital G, capital D mm -hmm. in that phrase. And it's in reality, maybe once you start to look at things through a lens of being more detached uh, from that, you see that there are deceptions and that there's opportunities that everybody jumps on, but there may not be the grand deception that the conspiracy theory might be make you believe. What I think would be really interesting to, is to talk about looking at all of this, your whole journey, getting deep into it retrospectively, how did it affect your life? Like when you started getting into it, like, did it affect the sort of the people you talked to? Did people stop talking to you? Did it affect your social circles? As I said, it completely consumed my life eventually. Within the first few years, like I, I had a big social circle. I was in a band. We knew all the other bands in the city and we all hung out like pretty much Monday to Sunday. When I started kind of getting into this, I didn't want to like not talk about it because it was such, felt like this is like really important for everyone to hear. Like you need mm -hmm. to hear this massive crime. People are dying now over it because there's a war going on over it and you, you need to listen, you know? And look, to be fair, not a lot of people want to talk about that when you're hanging out, partying and gigging and all that. So instead of talking to them, I didn't, I just went home, you know, and we would do a gig. 
I would go home. That was it. I didn't, I didn't go out afterwards, nothing. I'd go home and I'd watch whatever I wanted to watch. And like I said, I, I always say this, like they never left me. I left them because no one really wanted to speak about it or really challenge what I was saying because they didn't know how to challenge it. I isolated myself. You always hear about like conspiracy theorists being lonely or is that what makes them susceptible to this? In my experience, no, it wasn't that. It was that ideology is what isolated me. Those beliefs, those only wanting to talk about that stuff, that's what made me withdraw from all my friends. And it goes beyond that, like beyond my friendships. Yeah, yeah. So, so you weren't necessarily antagonistic or engaging in arguments with people or anything like that. You were just like, these people don't have the, the same level of knowledge and it doesn't seem like they want to. And so I'm going to go home and do more research. Yeah, basically. I just would like kind of settle on like, it's not really my job to wake people up. We can talk, yeah. can talk about it, but I'm not going to force it upon them because maybe it's just not their time yet. And when it is, they'll know that this is the stuff I've been talking about. They'll come and speak to me then. Have, have you heard from people in that circle after you've come out? And have you heard their perspective of, of how they viewed you and the, viewed those conversations? I've spoken to a, a couple. And, and it basically does boil down to, look, they didn't know how to engage with me. Yeah. They didn't know how to engage so they just didn't know how to react to what I was talking about. I, I get the sense that it was sort of the gravity of this. If it, if it was true, the gravity of it is huge, obviously. And if you're convinced it's true, it, is, is that accurate to say that it felt like the most important thing while you were in it? It probably started a bit like that, like a, a passionate hobby. But eventually just, you know, it was, this is why I say it's like an ideology. It became my, my worldview. Like it was a new religion. Like I was looking for symbols and signs everywhere. Is that a Freemason symbol? Is this a pentagram? All that kind of stuff. Like I lived it. It consumed me. It totally took me over like a cult-like ideology. And it, it did it spiral out from the 9-11 the inside job conspiracy into, into well, it must have, because you said you were fully into like cults running the world and things like that. Yeah. For, for lack of better terms, like I would, you could have called it a cabal today. Like I always think like my beliefs are proto QAnon. It's the same stuff, but the, the big difference is that we didn't have a good guy. We didn't have like a hero that was going to save us. Like at least I didn't believe that there was a hero that was going to save us. We had to do it together. But, but back to falling deeper. You know, it, how, how much deeper I eventually went, you know, it wasn't, it, it, it started off 9-11 and moved to like secret societies. And then these secret societies were like passing down magic and spells. And that kind of led into the elites are satanic and they are also pedophiles. That whole thing that Pizzagate and QAnon is talking about now. And it all co goes back to people like David Icke and Alex Jones and William Cooper and Jordan Maxwell. These are like the four people that I really started to follow back in those days and like mm. really consume all of their stuff. And like by consuming all of that diverse stuff and having such an open mind and being creative, I feel like I just was able to, if not believe some of it, entertain it and say, well, that's a possibility even if it came to something like David Icke and the reptiles. It's like, I didn't necessarily think, oh, they're definitely reptiles, but I'll entertain the thought that the reptilian thing must mean something else. You brushed on something I think is really interesting. A lot of conspiracies are kind of an interesting sap of creative energy, right? Because there is this creative element of, well, how does this all link together? It's like solving a puzzle. I think that's what kept me there because I am creative and I didn't really think of any of these sorts of things while I was down there. You know, this is all stuff I've been thinking of since coming out and like trying to yeah, work out. What does creativity and intelligence and all this have to do with like how susceptible you are to these beliefs? And I think humans can just entertain stuff like this is part of my journey now is trying to find out like what the tie is with conspiracy theories and like mythos or urban legends or folklore. Well, there's an aspect where you feel like you're solving a puzzle or unlocking something and it does make you feel really good. Like you've, you've unlocked this bit of knowledge that very, very few people have been able to unlock. And so if you are intellectual or creative, then it 
it feeds that feeling of, oh yeah, I'm, I'm exercising my mind and here's the reward of that is I've now understand something that very, very few people do. And it gets me entrance into this other group of people who understand the same thing. And now we have a shared vision. And before you know it, it's where we go one, we go all type of thing. Mm. And that intersection into into folklore being that it's it's all people informally transmitting these ideas to each other and kind of collaboratively world building to create this story and make all these connections. Someone has this idea that this is linked to something is linked to something else and they share that. And then someone's like, oh, but if that's linked to that, then this must mean this. And it's like cognitive dissonance rewired into creative world building that is poisonous because it is uh, creating all these inferences about the real world that aren't true. Yeah. And and like riling each other up to believe it as well. You kind of egg each other on to believe these stories that are told around the campfire. So what happens when there's a crack in the facade? What goes on mentally for people who are in the conspiracy at that point? Well, for me, in the early 2000s and early 2010s, there wasn't really anything countering us. Any Anything that kind of countered what, say, the conspiracy culture was doing was like, you know, some mainstream debunk of 9-11 or something. And that's obviously going to be part of the conspiracy. Easily dismissed. Exactly. You don't even have to watch it. Of course, oh, BBC and CNN have created these debunks. And and that's, you know, we wouldn't listen to any of that kind of thing. And to be fair, like, I feel like a lot of the debunking material pre-2018 has always been in a very uh, condescending manner, Mm. like not taking conspiracy theories serious at all, which uh, to be fair, I mean, like some of them are a bit silly. So sometimes you have to laugh. Right. But that doesn't change anyone's mind, you know? Yeah. So I didn't really come across very much when it came to debunks that I even really bothered listening to or thinking that, well, they have a point. But I think there's so much more out there today, so much more that like really does break it down, really does explain it, really does show the counter narrative. I'm super impressed having gone through all of that and not having the resources which are available now. What resources got to you? Like what was sort of the first crack in the armor of this conspiracy? What started you questioning those and and moving out of them? Sadly, it wasn't any other resources. It was experience. It was just seeing things not add up. But what really like did it is between 2015 and 2018, it's politics, it's democracy in action. It's seeing it like on social media, watching the people get involved and actually affecting change. The reason why that kind of broke something in me is because I thought all of democracy was a, was a game. All of it was a game that we went out and played we just participated in it because all leaders were selected, not elected from, from the outset. And it had nothing to do with what we did, you know, but I saw three elections in, in our section of the world, in the West, all in succession kind of thing that just went completely against what I thought was going on in the world. And that was Trump, it was Brexit, and it was Corbyn here in Britain taking over the Labour Party. These three things were just like impossible to me. They, they didn't serve the new world order. And what I had seen and had witnessed was people power actually making those things happen. You know, whether we liked the outcomes or not, it doesn't really matter. It's just that I saw that happen. Interesting. So it was, it was the action of people affecting change that was like, well, wait, if institutions are controlling everything, this wouldn't be happening. Absolutely. I think another component of that, though, is that some of the people that you are listening to as trusted sources were now spouting the stuff that was too ridiculous to believe, like Alex Jones fully evangelizing the crisis actor theory. And you're like, wait, if this guy is saying this thing that clearly to me doesn't line up with everything else that he would be saying, then let's go start to evaluate this. Was it that reasoned or did you just start to somehow find things that you were questioning. (laughs) You asked if it was reasoned. Well, probably not because my actual idea of it all was that the Illuminati, for lack of better term, had actually installed these like ideas as a psyop to destroy the truth movement. 
So it was the conspiracy kind of ate itself with more conspiracy and then it all just <laughs> yeah. exploded. Well, this is this is it, because I, I think the best way to describe it uh, to me is that I, I saw a rabbit hole and I entered it and I kept going down into it. And then I got into the hole of Earth and then I found another rabbit hole and I kept going and I finally come out the other side. It took me 15 years, but I went all the way down one and finally came all the way out the other side. So... I'm trying to think of a way of conceptualizing this because people that believe conspiracies are generally, they're not stupid people. They deserve our empathy and they deserve our respect in a lot of ways. So do you think that falling down a rabbit hole is like hijacking rational thinking? So it's not necessarily that people are irrational, but somehow the the loop of what rationality is has been turned in a weird direction. So everything connects or is, or is seeking very rational connections, but somehow the beginning point has been poisoned or there's some key points that have been poisoned. Absolutely. It's like we don't understand the flaws or the fallacies that we might be using. Yeah. But I've like I've spoken to quite a few psychologists and other academics who are all in agreement. Yeah, conspiracy theorists like could probably make the best detectives if they had the right tools. You know, if they knew how to actually drop the bias and and use critical thinking properly. We're kind of in a time now where I feel like most of us have a relative or a friend who is, it believes pretty sincerely in, in some flavor of messed up stuff. Like everyone's got a, a weird aunt or a wild uncle who's fallen down a rabbit hole. Do you have any advice on how to talk to people about that kind of thing or like, the best way to maybe not talk to them about it directly or just keep them involved or like, let's say that my aunt is super deep into QAnon and I'm asking you, what should I do? Like, what, what would you, what would you advise? I'd say, look, you are the best person to do it. Not some stranger on the internet, right? They're, they don't trust me. I've realized that like a stranger on the internet could be a, an agent, could be deep state. So they can't be trusted, but you, you're the loved one. You have a relationship built on trust, a relationship built on love, and you both experienced this relationship. So you're the best person to do it if you really can do it. All right. And I say can because I, I mean, do you have the energy and the time to actually do it? Right. If you do, then I'm going to shout out Mick West. His book is the book that you need to go get first because it's going to teach you all of those things that you need to know of how to engage without enabling them. And it will give you a good, good understanding of some of the key conspiracy theories that most conspiracists believe. You really need to put that energy in to learn what it is that they believe in, to understand why they believe in it. Now, if you haven't got that energy, that's also fine because it can take a lot out of you. Like, that's just how it is. What I suggest then is like, look, if they're anything like me, they might try to isolate themselves. So if you can't pull them out, keep them close and then maybe just, you know, listen to Mick West. <laughs> There's multiple ways of dealing with these with people, isn't there? You know, some people need that compassion. And I can do that compassion if you want to go one-on-one, -on -one, have a good faith conversation. Like, hey, I can do that anytime. I got empathy because totally understand. Totally understand why you believe what you believe. I totally understand that, you know, your concerns are valid. Like, if what you think is going on is going on, people should be paying attention to that. I, I get it. So I'll have that conversation. But then other people, like... They're going to react better to being like pushed, to being like annoyed by me. So I'm like a splinter under their skin or the adjuvant in, in a vaccine. That thing that actually <laughs> sparks annoyance to make it actually work. You know, it, people have to take it differently. That's a really good point. At the end of the day, they're conspiracy theorists, right? I was a conspiracist. I kind of understand the things that made me stop and go, whoa, what's this? So I want to do the same thing. I want to act like that first conspiracy theory video that they've watched about a specific thing that made them stop. Go, what? what is this? I want to cause that cognitive dissonance as well. That's such an interesting and good way to put that. Yeah, and I, I think that as, as long as we can help them feel like they're not going to be like losing everything about who they are at the end of that, right? Because if somebody says, oh, everything I believed in the world is gone, now who am I as a person? Then they can feel really lost and they're going to want to hold on to that conspiracy even deeper. But, you know, at some point, 
in their life. They, they fell down the rabbit hole, and they did look back at everything they thought they believed and said, oh, no, that was all wrong. I'm going to believe this set of things. So then coming back out should feel kind of like they should be made to feel or should have the liberty to feel like they've actually conquered something and are stronger for it. And I think so often people on social media and in the world want to point and laugh or point and deride rather than give them credit for the intellectual hurdles that they had to to do in order to kind of find the facts that would dispel all of those things that they believed. Yeah. I think when you do come back out, like you are free. Yeah. You don't, you've got like a perspective of the conspiracy world and the non-conspiracy world. Like I am so skeptical of everything, but in a good, good, healthy Mm -hmm. way. You know, even if I know someone's going to, someone generally tells me the truth, I'm going to look at him and be like, okay, are you telling me the truth this time? Right. I will never swallow anybody, any mainstream source, any alternative source, nothing (laughs) really like I'm free now. I'm living. That's the other thing. I said I was oppressed and I was had all these these thoughts in my head all the time just consuming me. But no, it's gone. It's all gone and I'm free and I actually I I can definitely see a lot more clearly now. And I and that's why I want to tell them. Like wake up, be free. Awesome. That's amazing. Nominal. Thanks, Doc. Oh, Digby. Hey. Dr. Sfinkel? Uh, yes, that's me. Hello. I thought you were a vet. Everybody's got a side hustle these days. Anyways, little fella is all set now. There you go. The flash drive? Yep. Okay. Don't, uh, don't put that in any computer that you, uh, want to keep working. What did... What's on it? Well, uh, Digby here got himself a little tiny virus, like a like a computer virus. Ah. Uh-huh. Yes, he ran wild in that uh, little implant of his. And how exactly did he get this virus? I may have tried to torrent the movie Gontarov into my brain. What, Digby? You guys left me all alone when you ran off to your little meme conference. You know that Gontarov isn't real. I know. Why do you think I torrented it? I had to see what it was. And what it was, was a virus. I had our IT guy uh, look at it, and he said it was like a Roman candle or something. Uh, Something like that. Trojan horse, you mean? Yes, that's it, yeah. Uh, It was some kind of horse virus. It might have kicked around inside his brain, which obviously wasn't good, so we took the horse out, and now it lives in that flash drive. I, um, I don't... You know what? Never mind. Thanks. Thanks so much for helping. Of course. That's <laughs> that's what doctors do. And I and and I'm a doctor. Right. Dr. Uh, Sfinkel. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Sfinkel. How about we all go home? I'm wiped. Yeah, me too. Good plan. If if I were you, I'd probably uh, put a label on that flash drive. Thanks for listening to Digital Folklore. If you like this podcast, tell two friends about it. Or leave us a rating and review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Or both. Or both. Special thanks to our guests this episode, Mick West, Benjamin Radford, and Brent Lee. Check out the show notes for links to their work. Thank you as well to our voice actors this episode. Digby was played by Brooke Jeanette of 13. Dr. Sfinkel was played by Tucker Bettys of Podcube. And the desk clerk was played by Lindsay Reed of Spooky Spouses. Special thanks as well to Matthew Bliss for editing the interview portions of today's episode. Digital Folklore is a production of Eighth Layer Media, which is an evil global mega corporation poised to take over the world. Oh, and speaking of that, join our Discord to help us start a cult. That might be a little bit too far. <laughs> join our Discord and don't help us start a cult. Perfect. Links in the show notes to everything. We'll see you next time. You know, I kind of want to see what's on that flash drive.